All right, friends, feel free to take your seat. That was fun. We haven't done two minutes with friends in a while. Well, feel free to take your seat, take a moment to collect yourself, and grab your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 10, taking a break from Revelation if that's okay, but we're in the same neck of the woods, Hebrews chapter 10, in the back of the New Testament. And as you turn there, I am just thankful this morning. I was driving in today, and I got here pretty early, so then I... After a little bit, I went and got some coffee, as one should. And I was just driving, and I was just thinking, and I was reflecting, and I just, the Lord brought tears to my eyes. And I'm just thankful for the opportunity that you and I both have to encourage one another in the word and to proclaim the word to one another. And so I'm thankful that we get to mutually do that this morning as we learn from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Feel free to read along on the screen or in front of you. Here we go. Therefore... Brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, this morning, I would love for us to think about confidence in Christ confidence in Christ. You and I, as believers of Jesus Christ, we have the beautiful opportunity to know and have relationship with the very person of Jesus. And because of the sacrifice that he has displayed for us on the cross, our relationship with God is actually now restored because of what Jesus has done for us. And the message, this gospel of Christ, is a message that you and I are invited to put our confidence in. As the Holy Spirit continues to work in and through our lives, we are constantly learning what this looks like to live confidently in Christ. Yet at the same time, you and I also know that we're human and we struggle and we live in a flesh that has a constant temptation to put our confidence in anything other than Christ. What is the world saying around us? What are the beliefs, the habits that we have, the desires of our heart that we're tempted to put our trust in? And the tricky part is is that this can often look so different each day. That just this past week, each one of us, has been tempted to find our confidence in something that we can hold in our hands. Maybe confidence in something that we can spend our money on. Confidence in something we did or did not accomplish. Maybe it's an attitude or a part of our personality. And that's just one layer, right? And then you look in your relationship with the Lord. And it's like we think that we can put our confidence. We're tempted to find our trust in how great we spent our time with him this week. Or we're tempted to put our trust in how emotionally close we felt with the Lord this week. It's so easy, no matter what it is, we constantly are met with the invitation to put our confidence in Christ, and we're met with the temptation to put our confidence in something which really, at the end of the day, is just manufactured in and of ourselves. And no, my hope for today is not to point these out. (laughs) Don't worry, my hope for today is not to call us all out, because you and I both, we're on a sanctifying journey with the Lord, amen, hallelujah. But my prayer for today is that we would actually instead look outward, is that we would think of these things, and yeah, we can talk about it, and we can think about it and turn to the scripture, but my hope and prayer for each of us today is that we would look outward, that we would look to the person and sacrifice of Christ. And this is where we find our main phrase that I would love to keep in our back pockets this morning. Our confidence is found in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Our confidence is found in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. My hope for today is that we would know this to be true and that we would learn what it looks like for us to respond. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you so much for your steadfast love that we can sing to every day, every moment that we can turn to, Lord. So I pray that that's what we think about today. The love that you have displayed for us on the cross, I pray that that is what we look to that we can think about these things that we struggle with in our heart, but that we can also turn outward and look to your love and look to the confidence that we can find in and through your sacrifice, Lord. We love you. We pray for eager hearts and open ears today, Lord. In Jesus' name, everyone said 
Amen. Okay, so you know me. Before we go in, I always love a little context, right? What's happening? What's the deal here? So think back with me to a time in biblical history in the Old Testament. This was before Jesus. Think of a time where the presence of God dwelled in a physical place. And you can actually read about this later in the book of Exodus. But the presence of God used to dwell in a physical place. And this was called the most holy place. Or sometimes we read it as the holy of holies. And this was referring to the inner room of the tabernacle that Moses had built for God among the Israelites. And if you keep reading in 1 Kings, we read that Solomon actually had the temple built. And again, in the temple was the most holy place. This was where the presence of God dwelled. And the crazy part about this is that this space, in order to confidently enter it, even approach it, you had to have a lot of things true about you. And there's a bunch of regulations you can read about in the Old Testament. You had to be a certain high priest. You had, to clean, you had to be cleansed. You had to have sprinkled blood. You had to many different regulations and sacraments that had to happen in order to approach this place. And inside the most holy place in this inner room was the Ark of the Covenant, which was a chest that contained the two stone tablets, which had the Ten Commandments on it. And here's the wild part. Are you ready? This place was only entered once a year. What? Come on. Where's the reaction there? Where's the gasp? This place was only entered once a year. And it's crazy because you and I don't think about this a lot because you and I today in our relationship with Christ, praise be that we have the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. But there was a time where God made a covenant with his people that the presence of God dwelled in this physical place. And to us, we, we might read only once a year. That, that doesn't seem right. Or, but to them, it was this very high honored way of living. It was this very high honored covenant. They respected this promise that they had with the Lord. And this was a big deal. The Israelites did not mess around because what would happen if you were to approach the most holy place without permission, if you weren't the right type of guy, it would result in death, right? So this was a big deal. The Israelites did not mess around. But once a year, on the Day of Atonement, a high priest of Israel would enter this place and they would perform a blood sacrifice where they would sprinkle the blood on the Ark of the Covenant in order to atone for the sins of the people. To think that the presence of God dwelled and was hosted in a certain place that was only visited once a year, this is something that was taken very seriously. And then, here's the plot twist for us. Ready? Look with me to verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place. Pause. <laughs> we just went from do not enter this place or you will die to now we, notice the plural language there, brothers and sisters, we now have confidence to enter the most holy place. How? Well, let's keep reading. By a new and live. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Verse 20. Since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is his body. Hallelujah. Friends, this is our message this morning, that now where once the physical presence of God dwelled in the most holy place, now through the blood of Jesus, we are able to have full access to the presence of God. Amen. <laughs> and I love, too, the imagery that's used here. Notice the word curtain, that the curtain that the author is talking about in verse 20 actually refers to the, the actual physical curtain that closed off the most holy place from the rest of the tabernacle. And the author is saying here that this curtain was, for us, it was, this was the body of Christ, that now this curtain has been opened, Christ's body has been broken, and we now have full access to the presence of God. Again, this isn't something we think about. Because for us, when we approach God, when we confidently enter his presence, we think about his Holy Spirit working in and through us. We think about the joys of gathering together as a faith family. It's, it's hard to think about a time where his presence dwelled in a physical place. But now through Jesus, we have immediate access. I love what one commentator states. As his body was torn on the cross, so the veil between God and men was torn, giving immediate access to God. It's crazy, too, how much history is spoken of here in just these first few verses that the most holy place was only entered by a select group of people. But now we, brothers and sisters, now have confidence to enter the most holy place. I love how the author here is using the two to, to show us the importance of this, that remember how important this place was and how much value and respect was shown. And now how much more glorious can we approach God through the body and blood of Jesus? Only through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, through the shedding of his blood and the breaking of his body, are we gifted with the confidence to approach the Father. 
And I love to notice the descriptive words used in verse 20, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. This is brand new. This is something that no one has ever seen before, right? This is something that is new. Jesus brought in a new way of life, and it's living, because once with the most holy place, there were, had to be the animal sacrifices with a deceased animal. But now Jesus, through his resurrection, are we able, through his living body, able to approach God the Father. Our confidence is found in the new and living sacrifice of Christ. And I love that, thinking back to earlier, you know, how we, we talk about, we have this invitation, right, to find our confidence in Christ, but we also have this lingering temptation to find our confidence in anything other than him. But may we be mutually encouraged this morning as we move forward, looking at these verses, that our confidence is not found in and of ourselves. Our confidence is not found in what we are comfortable with. Our confidence is not found in the things that we think we're good at when it comes to our faith. Instead, our confidence is mutually found in the very person and sacrifice of Christ. We have been gifted with this confidence found in his sacrifice on the cross. And from here, from this gifted confidence, we can now look at the rest of the passage as the author gives us three exhortations or three encouragements as to how we can respond. And I love this because it's kind of a two-sided coin here where we also respond in confidence, but also these three encouragements are invitations that we are invited to participate in these things as we continue learning in our confidence. All right, let's start with the first one. The first encouragement that the author here encourages us to do is to draw near to God. Verse 22, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. I love how beautifully simple yet complex this is, <laughs> that the first two descriptors, to draw near with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. I love the Expositor's Bible Commentary. They summarized this in a really cool way. They said, the heart stands for the whole of our inner life, and it is important that as God's people approach him, they be right inwardly. It is the pure in heart who see God. Furthermore, in view of what Christ has done for us, we should approach God in deep sincerity, the full assurance of faith stresses that it is only by trusting in Christ who has performed for us the high priestly work that gives access to God that we can draw near at all. I love this, that we're right inwardly, that there's the pure in heart as we are able to approach God with a sincere heart. And I'll, I mean, I'll call myself out here. If we're invited to approach God with the most sincere heart, to me that says our most authentic selves. And I think that sometimes Ellie in her most authentic selves is all that in a bag of chips. But then I look inwardly and I start to actually spend time with Ellie and I realize my most authentic self isn't really that great. It's pretty weak. It's pretty sinful. It's pretty, I mean, I complain, I'm lazy. There's weakness, there's imperfections there. And I love, but, 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 there's a but. <laughs> but Jesus allows us in those very imperfections that we have, that actually is our very invitation to draw near and our truest self. I love, I was reminded this past week of a verse found in 2 Corinthians 12, that the Lord's power is made perfect in our weakness. How, oh, I just am blown away that you're telling me that my most authentic self in the midst of my brokenness, in the midst of my weakness, am I able actually to receive the fullness of strength and power from Jesus? That we are able to draw near with a sincere heart really is to truly approach him as our weakest selves in need of a savior. And don't forget the other descriptor here, that we are to draw near with the full assurance that faith brings, that with our most authentic, broken, imperfect people, selves, we are able to draw near, fully assured of the work of the cross. Look at the last half of verse 22. Having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. I love, notice how these two go hand in hand, that as we draw near to God, we approach him as our truest selves. <laughs> and as we do that in our weakest form, we're met with beauty, we're met with the guilty, we're met with our guilt taken away, our bodies sprinkled and are washed with pure water. And these two, again, I love, Pastor Matt always tells me that the passages I happen to pick happen to have all sorts of historical, theological background. And I love it, because if you look, the sprinkling and the wash of pure water, these actually refer back to those sacraments of the most holy place. 
there would be a sprinkling of blood over the altar in the most holy place to atone for the sins of the people. And there would be a washing with pure water for the priests that were about to head in. They needed to be cleansed. They needed to be clean. And I love how the author in this passage, he's using the most important sacraments for the most holy place. And he's saying, now through Jesus, that happens to us. Now through Jesus, we don't have to cleanse an animal. We don't have to cleanse ourselves in a certain way. But now through his blood, his blood is the one thing that actually cleanses us and allows us to approach the Father. It's beautiful, too, because you can look at this with whatever approach we think, right? So there is an initial drawing near to God. When you and I have accepted Christ for the very first time, there's an initial belief, an initial, yes, I believe in the Lord, I draw near to him. And there's also a continuing, no matter how long ago or how recent that moment was for you, there's a continual drawing near to God that we have an invitation to constantly draw near to him. And then I love the question, okay, but what does drawing near to God really mean? How do you do that? How do you draw near to God? And well, when I think of that question, I think of a fun little acronym that we talked about here at Movement, which is the ABCs. To acknowledge that God is real, to acknowledge that his word has spoken to us already, to acknowledge what his word says about us, and to simply breathe, to allow ourselves to be at his feet, to allow ourselves to simply not say a word, but to simply tilt our chins up, to breathe, and finally to collapse into his Holy Spirit, recognizing that we are able and confident in and through his sacrifice. And I love it too, and you're not the first one to think this. I think all the time too, yeah, well, I do these things, but Ellie, you don't understand the sin that I walked through this past week. You don't understand, yeah, I get it that I can draw near to him, and I understand that his cross, the work on the cross is paid for my sin, but you don't understand the shame that I'm carrying. You don't understand the guilt that I'm carrying. When friends, honestly, that should be the very thing that invites us to the cross. Amen? The very things that we're struggling with, the very things that we're worried about, the very things that we're scared to talk about in prayer, we're scared to tell our pastor about, those should be the very things that invite us to the feet of the Father. I'm so thankful that you and I through the confidence we've been gifted in Christ, have the invitation to draw near to God. The second encouragement that we see in the text is to hold unswervingly to our hope. Verse 23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. I think to start out, what is our hope? LOL. <laughs> what is the thing? Before we think about holding unswervingly to something, what is the hope that we profess? Well, this is when I'm thankful for two things. The first thing that I'm thankful for this morning is that our hope is not found in and of ourselves, but our hope is found in the living, resurrected Christ. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 4, this is what that states. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This is is the hope that we are holding on to, found in and through the resurrected life of Christ. I love it too when you look at the life of Jesus, that through his life here on earth, we are able to learn through the word, we are able to learn more about him. Through the word that we're given, we're able to learn what was he passionate about, what was, what was his character like, what was his heart like. And through his death, not only are we now free from the sentence of sin that we once had, but we are also free from the power of sin and the power that it once had over us, and keep going through his resurrection. Are we now gifted, as First Peter says, with new birth into a living hope, into an eternal inheritance? This, friends, is the hope that we now proclaim. And the second thing that I'm thankful for this morning when I think of what is the hope that we profess is the rest, actually, of verse 23. For he who promised is faithful. To hold unswervingly to the hope that we now profess is to cling to the faithful promises that are found in the very sacrifice of Christ. Promises that bring us new life, promises that bring us eternity with him, and we see through the cross an abundance of grace, an abundance of forgiveness and love and mercy. These are the sweet promises that we are invited to hold unswervingly to. Speaking of swerving, <laughs> I remember when I first learned to drive, and I remember when my driving instructor, they taught me that the correct hand placement on the steering wheel is 10 and 2. Look at us. Safe drivers. I love it. 
And I remember the correct hand placement on the steering wheel was 10 and 2. And I remember if I wasn't holding on firmly to the wheel, I, I noticed pretty well and I would start to swerve. And so I'm from the second largest city in Michigan. And my dad, I'm thankful for it today. But at the moment, I wasn't as excited. My dad thought it was a good idea to get experience as a driver to take Allie on the busiest highway in Grand Rapids, which is called the S-curve, because it's actually shaped like an S. And now it's really fun, because I know how to drive, and it's kind of like a race car track. But in the moment, it's terrifying. And I learned very quickly, friends, that if I was not holding on firmly to the wheel, that I would lose control. I learned that the, the, the looser my grip was on the wheel, the faster my car would move out of control. I'm okay, nothing happened, I'm just, you know. <laughs> we learned very quickly as new drivers that the more you are holding on unswervingly to the wheel, the more control you have over your car. How true is this for us today? that when we start to lose hold of the belief that we have in Christ, when we think, yeah, I have one hand on the wheel, I'm okay, when we start to lose a hold of the grip that we have on our faith, we actually start to give permission to the things around us. We actually start to, to see things going out of control, and we start to allow the sin in our lives to play its work out. And how true is it that when you're driving, you know how when you're, maybe it's raining and your car starts hydroplaning, and all of a sudden you quickly grab onto the wheels or the, the steering wheel and you think, oh, I must have not really had that big of a grip on it. How true is this in our faith when our circumstances fly in, when there's different things around us, when our relationships are struggling, when there's something going on at our job, and we all of a sudden notice, whoa, I don't know if I had that tight of a grip on my faith. And I'm thankful, though, for the forgiveness of the Lord. I'm thankful that he's constantly working in and through us, that we constantly are reminded. And this is simply an encouragement. The author here is not saying, how tightly are you holding on to your faith? No, the author is saying, hey, hold unswervingly to the hope you profess. Hold on to the hope that we find in the cross. This is a constant encouragement. Because the reality is we're holding on to something. When something happens, when a circumstance gets thrown our way, we're either holding on to Christ or we're grabbing the nearest form of comfort that we can find, right? And I pray that we are encouraged this morning that it's a beautiful reminder that we are able to hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. How? Because we've been gifted with the confidence to do so. We've been gifted through the cross with the confidence to hold on to the message of Jesus. When the heaviness of our day-to-day -day feels overbearing, when we are struggling in our relationships, when we are seeking out our true identity, when we're trying to figure out what the heck is next in our life, we are able to remain steadfast in the knowledge and truth that we can confidently approach God, knowing that Christ has already gone before us and has opened the door to the Father, allowing us to hold unswervingly, to cling to the hope that we now see in him. May we hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. And finally, the third encouragement that the passage brings us to is to spur one another on. Verses 24 and 25 and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now this phrase, spur one another on, this is a fun one because it's interesting. If you look at the Greek word for this phrase, the Greek word is paroxysmus, and this word means to stimulate, encouraging interest or activity, but it also means to irritate and provoke. And it's interesting because this is kind of a negative connotation to this word. And you would think we actually get to spur one another on to irritate and to provoke our brothers and sisters towards love and good deeds, which is the last part of verse 23. That in other words, we really are here to irritate one another <laughs> toward love and good deeds. And I think of this word love, the expositors Bible commentary, they give us a helpful perspective. Here's what they say. Christians are to spur one another on to love. This is the characteristic New Testament term for a love that is not self-seeking, a love whose paradigm is the cross. It is interesting that this kind of love is thus a product of community, for it is a virtue that requires others for its exercise. I love how this quote says that it's a product, this love is a product of community activity, that we, as a community, are to spur one another on toward love and good deeds. And it's fun, too, because you think of the physical object of a spur, right? Any horseback riders out there? No one. That's okay. Anyone know what horseback riding is? There we go. Okay. So for horseback riders, there's actually spurs are little tiny 
spiked wheels. We have a picture of them. And these little spiked wheels actually sit on the heel of your boot as a horseback rider. And they're used to gently press into the side of a horse to encourage further movement, to encourage speed, to encourage interaction with the horse. And you would think that a small spiked wheel would be painful, but actually they were not created to cause pain. They were actually created to just encourage further movement. But if you use them incorrectly, they could end up hurting your horse. How true is this for us today, friends? That spurring one another on toward love and good deeds is not something that is supposed to bring us harm. It's not something that's supposed to bring us hurt. But it's to bring an irritation that causes movement. And if we use love incorrectly, we are causing pain. And this is where we, okay, this is where we have to be careful in the church because I, for me, and just in my experience, I see two extremes. There's an extreme of, oh, yeah, I'm loving others in the way that God loves, but actually we're loving others through the love of Jesus, and it's causing pain. It's causing hurt. We're not doing things correctly, and we actually start to cause spiritual hurt, some spiritual trauma, some spiritual pain, and it's so heartbreaking to see our broken hands <laughs> take the love of God and try, and we try and manufacture it. We try and twist it in the ways that we can, but really we just end up hurting other people. Or there's the other side, there's the other extreme, where we're just a little too soft, right? Like, oh, yeah, they know I love them. Oh, I see them. I see them living out in sin, but I don't want to say anything because, you know, we're called to love. And sometimes we think the love that we're giving out is actually a little too soft. It's a little too gentle that we're not actually speaking out in truth. But friends, as we spur one another on, may we be firm enough to spur one another on in truth but may we also be gentle enough to move forward with love. That there is, I love it. I mean, we think we love it, right? When we ask a brother or sister in Christ to hold us accountable, hey, I'm going through this sin. I'm going through this, this new discipline with the Lord. Would you just allow me to come to you or would you check in with me next week? And then they actually do. <laughs> and it's like, hey, how's that, how's that, that cycle you're going through? How, how's that doing? Or when we do life with one another and then someone actually comes to us and says, hey, you seem a bit off. Or, hey, I noticed that you're going through a, a different cycle in your life, and I don't think it's that healthy. And we start to see this repetition of, oh, our community around us is a community that wants to love us well. And I love, too, how this is continuing in the rest of the passage. Look at the other things we're invited to consider. Not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. I love this. And we don't know who the author of Hebrews was. We don't know who the audience is. So there might be a cultural context here that maybe there was a group that wasn't meeting together. But I love how this is a good reminder because as you and I continue meeting together here as a community, we continue learning how to best love one another in Christ. I'm so thankful that we get to do life with one another, that we get to learn about each other's personalities. We get to learn about each other's kids. We get to learn about each other's life rhythms. And we are able to spur one another on. We're able to irritate each other in a way that spurs us on to love and good deeds. We're able to see this pour over in the deeds that we're able to do for one another. We're able to see our love reach others in our community because of the love we've first been submerged when in Christ. I'm thankful. What a beautiful gift this is to know that we are invited to encourage one another as we see this day approaching. Notice those words. See the day approaching. This is referring to the second coming of Christ. This is referring to that moment when Jesus comes back. Until then, you and I are encouraged to spur one another on gently yet firmly in truth towards love and good deeds that we are able to not stop meeting with one another, but we're able to continue encouraging one another as we see this day approaching. Looking at the big picture, right, let's remember the three encouragements. We are to draw near to God. And as we, because of the body and blood of Christ, we are able to now approach God the Father. And we are called to hold unswervingly to the hope that we now profess, that we are able to cling to the promises that are found in the cross. And we're able to spur one another on toward love and good deeds. We're able to constantly press into one another, spurring one another on toward this confidence in Christ. Friends, may the truth of this message this morning be true in our hearts today, that you and I have no ability in our flesh to enter the most holy place. You and I, in our own most authentic selves, without Christ, we have no ability to approach 
throne, but it is in and through the blood and body of Christ that we are able to do this. Yet, I also pray that we are encouraged that this is something that we see happening. I don't want this to be a message of do this more, approach God. No, I'm thankful that we are able to see this happening in the lives of our church. I'm thankful that as I think of these past two years, I've been able to see God move in ways that I've seen hearts in our faith family draw near to God. I've seen, I look to my left, I look to my right, and I see continued hearts looking how to spur one another on, to hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. And I pray that it's encouraging to us this morning that this is what's happening. We're able to see a continued pursuit of confidence in Christ. But I wonder if we can go deeper. I wonder if there's a way that this moves past our time together. I wonder what it would look like for us individually as Christ followers to seek the confidence in Christ simply in our day-to-day, in our moment-to-moment, that we would simply turn to him and allow his confidence to take root in our hearts. Do we have the boldness to pick up the confidence we are gifted through the sacrifice of Christ? I know we have the boldness to approach him. We see it every week. We see it all the time with one another. But do we have the boldness to step into the new life that he is calling us to through his cross? A life that stands behind the sacrifice of Christ. A life that now identifies through the blood of Jesus. A life that identifies with his sacrifice. A life that says no to putting others down. A life that confidently puts forward love and good works. A life that finds a dissatisfaction in the pleasures of sin. And instead finds a life of quiet joy in the simple gospel. May the church be a community of believers that seeks to honor God and how they treat others. I'm so thankful that this is both a call to check ourselves inwardly also to see, hey, how am I right standing with God? What does this look like? What does this look like to approach my personal heart through the body and blood of Jesus? But it's also to look outward and to look at how the Lord is moving in and around us. And I'm so thankful that we get to do that. I'm so thankful that It is only through a sacrifice that we get to share testimonies, that we get to do life with one another. And so I would love, we're ending on time. I love this. I would love if we could utilize this space to simply pray for one another, that we would get in groups in just a little bit, and that we would use this time to first do a little check-in. Hey, how's your heart? How are things going? And also to use this time to think about these three things. Think about drawing near to God holding unswervingly to the hope that we now profess, and spurring one another on, what is the Holy Spirit speaking through these things? What is your heart thinking of when you think about these three things? Maybe there's a situation in your life where you're called to love someone with truth, but it might be a little firm. Maybe we can pray about that this morning. Maybe there's something that, a circumstance in your life that you're having a hard time holding on to the hope that you profess. We would love to pray for that. Maybe you're simply asking, what does it look like to draw near to God? (laughs) We would love to pray for that, and we would love to pray that our confidence would be found not in and of ourselves, but in Christ. Would you stand with me, please? I'd love to pray a sin as we get ready for prayer pods. Let's pray. Lord, we love you, and we're thankful for you. We're thankful for the knowledge and the truth that Our confidence is found in you, and through that, Lord, we're invited to draw near to you. We're invited to hold fastly and steadfastly, Lord, to the hope that we have in you. And, Lord, I'm thankful for the knowledge that we have, that we are constantly learning what it looks like to love others well. I'm thankful, Lord, that there is grace in that, Lord, as we are struggling to learn how to do that sometimes. Lord, I'm thankful for the grace that you provide. I'm thankful for the grace in our faith family as we continue to learn what it looks like to love others well. Lord, I pray that as we go about this week, as my brothers and sisters, as my friends here, as we leave this place, as we spend time in fellowship after service, as we go home with our families this afternoon, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you would encounter us this week, that the message of your sacrifice, that the confidence that's not in your sacrifice, I pray that it would encounter us in the smallest of things that we do this week, in the smallest of things where we're tempted to grab confidence in something else, we're tempted to say this to someone, we're tempted to to do this or to look at this, Lord, I pray that the confidence of your cross would encounter us in those moments, that we would actually look outside of ourselves, that we would look to you and your cross, and it is there that we find our hope to move forward, to love others well, 
and to find our confidence in you. We love you, and we praise you, and we thank you so much for the work that you have done for us and continue to do. In Jesus' name, amen.